Matthew chapter 18, verses 15 through 20. I used to really enjoy in the last church I pastored reading the old minutes. The minutes of the last church were the original minutes from 1840 something, if I recall, were in this large, large, oversized old book, handwritten, the members of the old church. And I took them out of the vault and would read them and actually would transcribe some of them. I thought they were fascinating. For instance, consider Hiram Wadsworth. Hiram Wadsworth joined the First Baptist Church of Dawson, Georgia, which is where I used to pastor, on the first Saturday of November, 1849. Baptist churches used to have their business meetings on the Saturday before service, and if you wanted to join, you would come do it at a members meeting. That's what they called it. So Hiram Wadsworth joins the church. But as the minutes progressed, I noticed that Hiram Wadsworth, Mr. Wadsworth's name kept appearing over and over again. In fact, Mr. Wadsworth kept being called in front of the church for intoxication. February 1852, November 1852, May 1856, March 1857. The offense, the charge brought against him was intoxication, 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 and intoxication. And this was recorded in the minutes. Mr. Wadsworth's response to being brought before the church is as follows. February 1852, repentance. November 1852, repentance. May 1856, repentance. March 1857, repentance. And then the minutes also recorded the response of the church to Mr. Wadsworth's repentance. And here is that response. Henry Wadsworth, Hiram Wadsworth, rather. February 1852, forgiven. November 1852, forgiven. May of 1856, forgiven. March of 1857, forgiven. What is this? This is what's called church discipline. And the minutes of the old church and older Baptist churches and other churches frequently showed the application of what's called church discipline, especially as it's recorded in Matthew 18, verses 15 through 20. If your brother sins against you, go and tell him his fault between you and him alone. If he listens to you, you have gained your brother. But if he does not listen, take one or two others along with you, that every charge may be established by the evidence of two or three witnesses. If he refuses to listen to them, tell it to the church. And if he refuses to listen even to the church... Let him be to you as a Gentile and a tax collector. Truly, I say to you, whatever you bind on earth shall be bound in heaven, and whatever you loose on earth shall be loosed in heaven. Again, I say to you, if two or three, if two of you agree on earth about anything they ask, it will be done for them by my Father in heaven. For where two or three are gathered in my name, there I am among them. I want to point out something interesting, that verse where two or three are gathered in my name, there I am among them, is all the time used to legitimize small gatherings of worship. Rightfully so. If there are two or three Christians, Jesus is here in the midst of us. But in point of fact, that verse is used in a church discipline section the original context of that verse refers to removing people from the church under discipline. If you look at verse 20, it refers to the church kicking someone out. It says, if two or three are gathered, there I am in the midst. That's not the point of my sermon, but I just want to point that out. When people say that, you say, well, that's true, 
But specifically what it meant was where two or three are gathered, you can remove the third and get down to two if you're not careful. I thought that was funnier than it appears to be, apparently. So let's talk about church discipline. First, the what of church discipline. What is church discipline? Well, when you look at Matthew 18, 15 to 20, you see, I believe, four steps in the process of church discipline, and there is a fifth step in 2 Corinthians. The four steps are these. A personal and private appeal to the person who has sinned. Second step, if that doesn't work, an appeal with two or three witnesses. Third step, asking the church to appeal to the member. Fourth step, placing the member outside the fold. And then in 2 Corinthians chapter 2, verses 6 through 8, we see Paul instructing the church on how to respond to a repentant person who has been removed from the church, possibly the person discussed in 1 Corinthians 5. So 2 Corinthians 2, 6 through 8, Paul instructs the church to forgive the repentant brother so that he does not despair. What you can see if you look at Matthew 18 are that the circles of church discipline, the five steps, reside within three ever-expanding circles. They move from personal and private to larger than personal and increasingly public. So circle number one is very small. These are concentric circles. A personal and private appeal. If a person sins against you, go to the person alone. Second circle, a little bit bigger. Appeal with two or three witnesses. That's Matthew 18, 16. And then the third circle encompasses steps three, four, and five. You ask the church to appeal to the member. You place the member outside the fold, and then the church accepts the person's repentance, and they come back into the the fold. Now, one of the things we need to understand is that these guidelines of church discipline in Matthew 18 are guidelines. Now, they're from Jesus. They're not to be dismissed, but they're not meticulously exhaustive meaning they don't tell you exactly everything to do. For instance, how much time do you allow between the steps? If you go by yourself and confront someone who is in sin and say, I come to you as a brother or sister, come to you in love, you really need to stop doing this and you talk with the person. Do they have an hour to repent? Do they have a week Do they have a month? Um, What about if you go with two or three witnesses and say, listen, we're pleading with you. You need to stop doing this. This is one example. The Bible does not give us exhaustive details. This is where the Holy Spirit, the wisdom of the church, and the freedom of Christ comes into play. Different scenarios might require different amounts of time. If you go to someone and say, you are continuously seen in a violent, drunken stupor around town, we want to pay for you to go to rehab. That person may need a day to think about it. Maybe they can make the decision right then. Maybe you say to them, talk to us next week, but we're we're worried about you. We're concerned for you and for the witness of the church. So that's, that's one example. Another example is when you are confronted with something that makes the first and even second step difficult to do. For instance, when Paul wrote the church in 1 Corinthians 5, he tells them that they are all aware that there is a man in the church having a relationship 
with his father's wife, probably his stepmother. Regardless, it would have been considered an incestuous relationship if it were the biological or the stepmother. Extremely inappropriate. Paul says to them, you should have mourned. This is read out loud to the church. Instead, you're proud. Now, nowhere does Paul say, send one person to talk to this person and tell them to stop and then send two or three. No, he says, when you're gathered together, hand this man over, meaning remove him from the church. Why does Paul skip the first and second steps in 1 Corinthians 5? Because the nature of the act was already so public that a private consultation would have almost made no sense. So my point is this. When you read Matthew 18, you want to realize that we're given guidelines on how to approach someone for correction, but the guidelines are not exhaustively meticulous. I myself am of the opinion that we should try our absolute best to do precisely what Jesus said to do, but we must take into account the complexities of each individual situation, how public it may or may not already be, and the nature of the act. On the other hand, it cannot be the case that the flexibility we have there leads us to ignore Matthew 18. Jesus does give us steps, and in probably many cases, most cases, you can go to someone and simply follow sequentially those steps. I also want to point out that this teaching from Jesus, Matthew 18, 15 to 20, go to someone alone, take two or three, then go to the church about it. This teaching would not have actually been unusual to the Jewish disciples and crowds. Uh, For instance, part of the rabbinic teachings, the rabbis, their traditions included something like this. Also, the Qumran community and Mosaic legislation have certain principles. And if you think about it, there really is a kind of common sense reality to this. Uh, Even our, our own sense of personal justice would tell us, if you see someone doing something wrong, your first impulse should not be to go get 50 people to confront them. Your first impulse, decency would tell you, You go to a person and try to protect their dignity and say, look, man, I mean, let's talk about this, right? So what is unique, though, is that Jesus is giving these instructions to his disciples in the context of the new reality called church. And I know that Pentecost hasn't happened yet, but he is giving them a glimpse of what life in the church will be like. So the difference isn't so much the steps. It's the spirit of the steps and the major difference between church discipline and worldly efforts to correct someone in sin is the cross. We go to one another as sinners before the cross, carrying the cross, offering the forgiveness of the cross. That's the difference. Another difference is we are calling on people to be what we are supposed to be as the church. So it's not just, hey, you're doing something that's bad for you. It's also you're doing something that's hurting you and hurting the entire body of Christ. We've got to get this right. So I once dealt with a church discipline, church discipline case that was so public it was discussed in town, right? This man who does these things and harasses these people goes to that church. So part of our appeal to this guy was, man, you're really hurting yourself with your behavior and you're hurting all of us because there are people who were literally telling us, we will not come into your church so long as that man is in there with the way he behaves himself. And it was egregious behavior, and they were correct to say it. The secondly, the when of church discipline. When does Matthew 18 
come into effect. I mean, look, you don't start a formal process of church discipline with every single thing. If you're, if you're at a friend's house and he's changing his tire and something slips and he hits himself and says something, hits himself and says something unbaptist, I don't know that you need to say step number one. Do you repent or shall I bring two or three? There's, I'm not talking about the difference in sin, but I am saying there is a normal day-to-day living together where we can help each other, right? Then there are things that do threaten the witness of the church. If we were faithful to love each other enough to help each other with step one, hey, man, you seem to kind of struggle with this. Or, hey, you know, I, I saw this. I'm not watching you. I'm not stalking you. But I was a little concerned about this. That kind of thing, we could really help each other. So when do we do this? Well, what Jesus says in Matthew 18, verse 15, is this. If your brother sins against you, go and tell him his fault between you and him alone. So first of all, we are given the trigger. That's not the best image to draw on here. We are given the rationale for church discipline. If your brother sins against you, go to him alone. So when do we do this? We do this when our brother sins against us. Now, it has been objected that technically what Jesus says in Matthew 18 is if your brother sins against you, right? That Jesus doesn't technically say if you see your brother sin, it's directed at you. However, there are some problems with that. First of all, in the body of Christ, according to what Paul says in 1 Corinthians, we're all connected. When we sin, it is always against each other. It really is. There really are no private sins anymore. Um, Look at pastor scandals. Whenever some pastor falls morally or however, people not involved with the pastor's sin are adversely affected, and the church is sinned against. God is sinned against first and foremost, but the church is wounded. Secondly, however, elsewhere in Scripture, Jesus does use sin in the general sense. So this is what Jesus says in Luke 17, right? Pay attention to yourselves. If your brother sins, rebuke him, and if he repents, Forgive him, and if he sins against you seven times in a day and turns to you seven times saying, I repent, you must forgive him. Notice there that Jesus says sin without sin against you, but then he says sin against you as if it's synonymous with sin in general. My point being, the process can be involved if it's not directly against you because all sin in the body of Christ is against everyone. An analogy would be this. If someone said to you, uh, for instance, uh, Bob Marley died of cancer that was discovered in his toe. Now, if someone said to you, I don't have to worry about the rest of my body. The cancer's just in my toe. What would you say? Well, we know how foolish that is. Right, And Paul addresses that again in 1 Corinthians, that uh, actually in 1 Corinthians 5, that one bad apple kind of a thing, right? Also, I do want to point out, just because you may find this interesting, but many of the oldest manuscripts of Matthew chapter 18 actually do not even include the words against you. A good number of them just say, if your brother sins, go to you. Now, that's neither here nor there to us, but it is something to take note of. Um, The New Testament scholar Estella Horning wrote this, regardless of which was the original text of Matthew, 
or the precise words of Jesus, an understanding that limits the believer's responsibility only to personal offenses against oneself violates the spirit of the text, spirit of the context. Every Christian, she writes, is to be concerned for the safety and well-being of every other Christian brother and sister. Therefore, if we hear about someone who sins, or if we observe sinful behavior, we are responsible to confront the person and seek to restore that person to the right path of self-discipline and humility. But then she writes, the goal is not to accuse, prove guilt, or punish, but to set the brother or sister back on the right track of healing and wholeness. And this is very important. Church discipline, rightly done, is not punitive or retributive. It is redemptive. The point is you're grieving for a brother or sister, and you want them to come back. Now, the who of church discipline. If you take one, and then you take two or three, and then you tell the church, and the church appeals to the wayward brother or sister, and they ignore the church, what do you do? Well, we actually have a few different passages in the New Testament that consider this. In our text, Jesus says, if he refuses to them, if he refuses to listen to them, tell it to the church. The word he uses is ecclesia, which is simply the Greek word for assembly. It's actually a political term. I mean, if you got a group of people together at the civic center, you'd call it the church in Greek back then. It was the ecclesia. The church took the word, and now we call ourselves the church. But originally it was just a gathering. But in 1 Corinthians 5, Paul says about that gentleman, when you are assembled in the name of the Lord Jesus, and I am with you in spirit, and the power of our Lord Jesus is present, hand this man over to Satan so that the sinful nature may be destroyed and his spirit saved on the day of the Lord. So there he calls on the entire church. 2 Corinthians 2, 6. The punishment inflicted on him by the majority is sufficient for him. He's talking about the church at large. 1 Timothy 5, 20 and 21. Those who sin are to be rebuked publicly so that the others may take a warning. I charge you in the sight of God and of Christ Jesus and the elect angels to keep these instructions without partiality and to do nothing out of favoritism. So if it reaches this point, who is to be told in the church? The assembled body of believers, 1 Corinthians 5, a gathering large enough to cause the offending member to feel grief and sorrow, 2 Corinthians 2, quote, the majority, 2 Corinthians 2, 6, and to a body larger than two or three, the second step, Matthew 18. But, brothers and sisters, let me say, this is the absolute last step. Um, every now and then, a couple times here at the church, we've had people say, why don't we ever see public church discipline? And it's because without apology, we work very, very hard to never reach steps three, four, and five. I mean, the ultimate goal, um, l- let me just say this openly, church discipline is practiced here and has been practiced a number of times. But thank God we have not had to bring people before the church, so to speak. We, we don't want to do that. Would we? Yes. If there was something of that level that threatened the peace of the church and a person was absolutely obstinate, sure, sure, done it before. But that's very difficult and very painful and very hard. It reaches a point You do that, I believe, when it creates damage not to do it, right, to the person and to the church. But but let me just be clear. If you take someone to lunch and sit down and say, brother, sister, look, um, I'm a sinner. I come to you as a sinner myself. But can we talk about this? That's church discipline. That's, That's step one. And you pray to God you never have to go past step one. And you work really hard not to go past step one. And let me say again, if we were diligent on step one, we really wouldn't have to go to a lot of steps two, three, four, and five. Lastly, the why of church discipline. Why would a church do this? I mean, why? 
Let me give you an example of why from Tony Evans. Quote, one brother who went into wild living, divorced his wife, refused to repent, was removed from the church, Tony Evans' church. His life fell apart, and after three years, he called the church and said, I want to repent and come home. We met with him to examine his life, look for fruits of repentance, since we can't read people's hearts. When he demonstrated his repentance, he was brought back to church on a Sunday morning. He stood before the church and apologized to the people. He also said that if his wife would have him back, he would like to come home to her and make up for the years that had been wasted. The man's wife had been praying for him these three years and had not given up hope. I called her forward on this Sunday morning and performed the wedding right there in the middle of the service amidst a lot of crying and cheering. Now, whatever you may think of the specifics of that, that's the goal. The goal of church discipline is not to drag someone up in front of the Central Baptist Church on Fairway and put them in stocks and then encourage the members to drive by periodically and throw rotting cabbage at them. That's what they think this is in the movies. That's why you always see these terrible churches, you know, in medieval times with dungeons. No, that's not us. No, we love each other enough to call each other back from destructive behavior, right? This is church discipline. What's the goal of church discipline? Watch this. In Luke 15, what did the shepherd do when he found the wandering sheep? When he comes home, he calls together his friends and his neighbors, saying to them, Rejoice with me, for I have found my sheep that was lost. Just so I tell you, there will be more joy in heaven over one sinner who repents than over 99 righteous persons who need no repentance. What did the woman do after she found the lost coin? Luke 15, 9 and 10. When she found it, she called together her friends and neighbors saying, Rejoice with me, for I have found the coin that was lost. Just so I tell you, there is joy before the angels of God over one sinner who repents. What did the father of the prodigal son do? But while he was still a long way off, his father saw him and felt compassion and ran and embraced him and kissed him. And the son said to him, Father, I have sinned against heaven and before you. I'm no longer worthy to be called your son. But the father said to his servants, bring quickly the best robe, put it on him, put a ring on his hand, shoes on his feet, bring the fattened calf and kill it. Let us eat and celebrate. For this, my son was dead and is alive again. He was lost and is found. And they began to celebrate. Matthew 18, properly understood, is a beautiful passage that shows us how to love each other in the most difficult of ways when we go astray. And I would say this to you in conclusion. If I go astray, please do not hate me so much that you don't try to win me back. Church discipline is how the church tries to win each other back. It is not loving to look at a wayward brother and say, well, forget him. Or a wayward sister, forget her. No, Jesus says, be the shepherd that leaves the 99 and go after her. Go after him and bring him back and there'll be great rejoicing.